Good afternoon. I'm Janice Stein, the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. And today we have convened a panel of experts uh, to discuss the latest developments in the escalating conflict between Russia and Ukraine. We are delighted to have with us Timothy Fry, the Marshall Shulman Professor of Post-Soviet Foreign Policy at Columbia University. Tim's latest book is Weak Strongman, The Limits of Power in Putin's Russia. What a great title, Tim. We're especially privileged to have with us two of our colleagues who are currently in Ukraine, Alexei Haran, who is Professor of Comparative Politics uh, at the Kiev Moyla Academy and the Research Director of the Democratic Initiatives Foundation. And today he joins us from Kiev. Uh, I also welcome Timofey Molanivov, President of the Kiev School of Economics, also an Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh and former Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Agriculture in Ukraine. And last but not least, our own Luke and Ray, a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. And he is the co-director of the Petro Yasik program for the study of Ukraine here at the Monk School. It's a special delight to welcome Peter Mansbridge, whose current title is Senior Fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy, but he's Canada's most distinguished and most respected journalist in the field of public affairs. Over to you, Peter. Manis, thank you very much. And that was, uh, that was quite a an introduction, a little over the top, but I'll take it nevertheless. Uh, and thank you to all of those who've joined us from uh, literally all over the world who are online watching the presentation. We want you to know um, that while I have a series of questions for our different uh, distinguished panelists, um, we also want to hear your questions as well. And here's the easiest way to get through to us on Zoom's Q&A field. If you're watching on YouTube, which I know some of you are, please send your questions to events.monk, that's M-U-N-K, at utoronto.ca. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, so let's get right at it. As I said, in, in terms of our great guests that we've uh, got for this uh, next hour, uh, two of whom are in Ukraine, as Janice uh, mentioned. I want to start there because... Given the situation, we never know how long that communication line uh, is going to be available to us. So, um, Timofey, and I hope you don't mind if I use first names here uh, for the purposes of the panel. Uh, Timofey, what can you tell us about the current situation as it stands at this moment in Kyiv? So it's the second day of attacks. The attacks started yesterday, and we woke up... Uh, um, around 5.15, 5.30 a.m. Uh, to the sounds of uh, what later turned out to be cruise ballistic missiles and also um, air-to-surface missiles. Um, then there was an escalation of this uh, conflict during the day and a lot of uh, ground troops moved in uh, from all kinds of directions, from the east, from the north and from um, the south of Ukraine. Um, they moving in, you know, towards uh, different towns. Um, there was an attempt to, and a successful attempt to, um, for a while to capture a um, air base, um, the home of uh, actually world known Antonov. Um, that air base is 20 miles or so uh, to the west, northwest of Kyiv. And uh, it, uh, there were about 34 Russian attack and transport helicopters and they uh, got paratroopers and special ops on the ground and the Ukrainian military uh, took the airport back uh, after several hours of uh, uh, 
quite uh, serious engagement. Uh, so that was yesterday. Um, and uh, uh, overnight, uh, there were additional attacks, much more, you know, heavy. And now civil areas have been targeted much more severely. There have been attacks on civil areas uh, during the first airstrikes. Uh, but during the second ones, you will see, you know, every, there are widely circulated uh, uh, pictures of uh, uh, buildings in Kiev uh, and uh, multiple uh, uh, engagements with, uh, with missiles. Um, and during the day, there were uh, attempts to take Kiev uh, coming this time, not through paratroopers and through uh, kind of air, uh, but just pushing from uh, the Belarus. By the way, I would like to mention, it's, this is not really in the news, everyone is talking about Russian invasion, but they are coming from the Belarusian border too. And so that's Belarusian invasion too unless Belarus has become a part of Russia and doesn't have any agency and sovereignty. So, you know, it's not just Russian invasion, it's Belarusian invasion too. And that somehow gets, uh, gets lost uh, in the discussion. And um, um, yeah, so. Okay, that, that paints a, a remarkable picture for us. Uh, let me bring Alexei into the conversation as well, because he's also in Kyiv. Uh, one of the things that has been um, stuck out to all of us who are watching this war in real time on television uh, is the scenes of, uh, of families and their children in subway stations uh, rushing for cover in, in different parts of uh, Kiev and other cities in Ukraine. Can you talk to that point, what that's been like in terms of civilians who are trying to deal with this situation unfolding around them? Well, as I understand, the situation is difficult with civilians. Uh, so many evacuated in, from Kyiv. Um, <clears throat> others are, you know, spending night and day in the underground stations or in bomb shelters. So yeah, it's really tough. A lot of shops are closed, but not all. So basically it's possible to, it's possible to get some food. Uh, the ATM, uh, ATM, банкоматы закрыты, да, все? Okay, most ATM machines doesn't work. No, no cash. However, today I just tried to order money for, from my bank for Monday and I succeeded. So it means financial system still works. Um, now, um, I would like to continue what Timofey said. Yes, so yesterday, yes, yesterday in the evening, it was very, uh, it was very, there was very hard time because we heard that, uh, I mean, psychologically, because the airport air, uh, near Kyiv was seized. So it seems that everything is going out of control, but then the situation stabilized. So now I hear, because I'm actually in the north of Kyiv, the front is, um, how many, maybe to Vyshgorod is maybe about 20 kilometers. So uh, the shelling started again right now in maybe half an hour ago. Uh, however, I went out just to have a fresh air and I saw volunteers with arms. So just civilian guys who took arms. And that was really encouraging. And to hear what they are saying. So basically what happened today, today it was possible to get, to get weapons. You know, it was spread just in the streets. And uh, from one source, 10,000 Kievites received guns. Another source is 18,000. So even it's 10,000, this is very impressive. So people are staying in lines to get, uh, to get involved in the territorial defense, to get weapons or to be actually for the army. And you, hear, and you see these lines not only in Kyiv, but in other places, for example, in Transcapesa. So one more encouraging thing, I am sorry to say, is that 1,000 Russian soldiers were killed. And it's the highest loss of the Russian army per day 
since 1991. At the same time, 60 Ukrainians were killed. Definitely for today, the number would, would increase from both sides. That's clear. But uh, it, it's also clear that what Putin planned to have a very you know, quick game, quick victory, no, he's not succeeded. And we hear the interview today or statement of Putin today and we saw he is really irritated. So it means he doesn't, doesn't have full control of the situation. That's, that's clear. As, as of now, no regional center of Ukraine is under control of Russians. There is very difficult situation in Sumy, in Chernigiv. Kharkiv is very close to the front line, also in Kherson. But as of now, no center, regional center is controlled by Russians. So which means that we have two days, we are going into the third day, the sanctions are arriving, the weapons are arriving, and it will definitely make situation difficult for Putin, not to say that we, Ukraine, we have already moral victory. Every, everybody in the world feels and understands what's going on. I would like just to add that since 2014, we were talking to the West that we are at war with Russia, that Russia is occupying Don part of Donbass, that there is Russian army within Ukraine. But the diplomatic language was very different. Breakaway republic, self-proclaimed republics. You need to have dialogue and all this stuff. Russia is not occupying. It's domestic conflict. Now it's very, very clear. And we got a victory here. I am pretty sure about that. Whatever would be the losses. All right, Alexei uh, and Timofey, thank you for the, you know, painting us a picture of what it's like inside right now. I want to bring in our other guests, and I will get back to you. Uh, Janice, let me, let me start with you, because I want to go from, from the picture on the ground in Kiev and on, in Ukraine to the big picture. Um, there are those who are saying now we have... Um, reach the end of the post-Cold War era, that we're in a new era now as a result of the actions of Russia in the last 48 hours. Um, do you agree with that? And if you do, what is the era we're in now? I think there's no question that we have seen the last gasp uh, of the liberal international order. Um, this put the final nail in the coffin and we are at the beginning of a new period, um, broadly speaking, in international politics. Uh, we certainly are in a period of great power rivalry. How this will play out, um, and I know my colleagues are going to weigh in on this, uh, but we have a complex relationship now between Russia, China, and the United States. It is not clear how three great powers maneuver and managed to avoid accident, miscalculation, um, and conflict. And that is the big question, Peter. What is this new order in which the norms that Europeans believed in, that there would not be a forcible conquest by one state of another, that was the bedrock norm, that illusion has been blasted away by what Putin has done in the last 72 hours. Lokan, uh, if I can ask you, um, you know, we, we, we heard from our friends, colleagues in, in Kyiv there, and they, they paint a particular picture of what's happening, um, the numbers from both sides in terms of what's happened in casualties and dead in the first, you know, 48 hours are, are going to differ. And those numbers are always going to be challenging to figure out what's exactly true. But you know, if, if there's one thing that's of no doubt, it's that Ukraine is the underdog here. Um, what is the best Ukraine can hope for uh, in this current situation? Well, it's no doubt that uh, there's an enormous imbalance between the Russian army and the Ukrainian army, both in terms of size, in terms of how well equipped they are. Um, and, you know, the, the, the military spending in Ukraine is one tenth of that in, in Russia. Uh, and I think that sort of, you know, it's very possible, although so far the Ukrainians have resisted, and, and I think it's quite remarkable 
how well they've resisted that 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 that, uh, that Russia will defeat Ukraine militarily. Although that's, uh, but I think even if it does, um, I think it's very likely you know that it doesn't end there. You know that uh, basically Putin um, had fully expected the the Ukrainian government to completely collapse. It has not. It has held its own. And I think um, that even if, if Putin achieves a military victory in the short term, you're likely to see a long drawn out guerrilla struggle. Listen, I mean, Western Ukrainians uh, fought the, the Soviet occupiers for a decade after World War II. It took one of the most repressive totalitarian governments to suppress them. You know, they also then in the 1990s and 2000s overthrew two autocratic governments. They are not going to sit back and let the Russian occupiers, you know, have their way. So I think you're likely to see, a, in the best case scenario, from the Russian point of view, sort of a, a really long drawn out occupation. Um, you know, some estimates are that um, that it will take about 800,000 Russian troops to truly occupy the territory of Ukraine. So yeah, so I think it's you know it's it's far from over. Um, let's go from Toronto to New York, and uh, Timothy. Uh... So grateful to have you join us on this discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you either watched or, or have read about the speech that Putin gave today, which, you know, he's playing hard the, the sort of the Nazi, the fascist, um, the drug dealer card. In, in, in this case today, pleading with the Ukrainian army uh, to uh, take on its own leadership and to bring down its leadership. What does that tell you about how this situation is unfolding? Uh, Timothy, you may be muted if you just want to check that. I think it tells me that uh, I think Mr. Putin has been frustrated by the way events have unfolded. Um, I think you know when leaders threaten to use force, uh, they would prefer to attain their political goals without having actually to wield that force. And uh, Putin's hand has been forced in the sense that uh, the Ukrainian government has not backed down. Uh, they did not capitulate to uh, Russian demands. Uh, NATO for all of its uh, differences and uh, disagreements has unified and banded together in a way that I don't think President Putin expected. Uh, the German decision to suspend Nord Stream 2, I think, also must have caught him off guard. Uh, and, you know, the fighting on the ground, although, uh, you know, Russia has massive advantages, uh, as Lucan pointed out, you know, has not gone as smoothly uh, as he might have liked. You know, it's not the first time that a leader has had uh, excessive optimism about uh, you know, the military's ability to seize territory and to achieve uh, uh, quick gains. So I think the language that Putin is using uh, about denazification and genocide, um, it's, uh, it's really over the top in a way that I think many people find disturbing. And I'm not sure how well it will play in Russia and Putin likes to invoke uh, the memory of World War II, uh, but that legacy cuts two ways. It is a way for Putin to easily tap into nationalist sentiment. At the same time, uh, Russians know full well uh, that war is costly and leads to great loss of human life. So if you look at public opinion polling in Russia, uh, it tends to be very sensitive to loss of life. Um, so if you, for example, the support for the intervention in Syria has never been very great. Support for introducing troops into Eastern Ukraine in 2014 and 2015 when fighting was really hot was also low. Uh, so I think Putin is frustrated that there has not been a kind of groundswell of support that he expected. Yeah, and if he's gonna use World War II as a, an example, he should keep in mind um, in the early days of, uh, of WW2 in 1939, when the Germans invaded Poland, it was supposed to be a walkover in a, in a matter of hours. Uh, the Poles arrived with, on horseback and riding bicycles, and they, and they, they put up a fight for a, a couple of weeks because they believed in their country and they believed in fighting. And we're seeing, as we've heard already, 
um, from inside Kyiv that the fight is very much underway. Just one other quick one, and it's about the oligarchs, Timothy. Um, the, the Western nations put in their sanctions yesterday, and much of the time in explaining it, they talk about where you know we're, we're going after the oligarchs. We're trying to convince them that they've they've sided with the wrong guy here by by siding with uh, with Putin. Is there the potential for success in that? Can they make that argument and hope that the the internal disruption uh, in Russia will happen through the oligarchs? Well, we have to be realistic about what sanctions can accomplish. I think it's pretty clear in the research that's been done that when countries have national security interests at stake, uh, sanctions are economic sanctions are su- just not sufficient to really deter them from doing things that they think that they really need to do. Uh, at the same time, uh, that doesn't mean that countries shouldn't use sanctions. Sanctions do raise costs on specific actors. They send a strong signal of resolve in that some of these sanctions and actions will have real costs for the countries that are imposing the sanctions. You know, Germany uh, suspending Nord Stream 2 will cause Germans to pay higher uh, prices in energy, and they already pay uh, very high prices. Sanctions are also important to send a signal to third parties like China, uh, who uh, would also expect to have uh, you know, economic blowback on them should they decide to um, violate international norms. And then finally, the sanctions are important as a bargaining chip. Uh, as um, uh, you know, conflict subsides and the parties actually sit around the table, you know, sanctions can be a useful bargaining chip to gain some um, uh, advantages that otherwise would be difficult to get. So the sanctions are important, they cause pain, they send a strong signal, but at the same time, we need to be realistic about what they can accomplish. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're, uh, we're asking for your questions and already we've been receiving a lot of them and I'm gonna get to them uh, in just a moment. I just wanna go back to Kiev for a moment uh, to ask both of our guests there uh, a couple more questions. Timofey, uh, you were at one point in the cabinet of uh, President Zelensky. Uh, he has talked a number of times from an undisclosed location uh, to the public and to the world. Um, just how much can he do from his undisclosed location? And one assumes a, a, a disconnected uh, you know, track towards uh, governing. Uh, just how much can he do um, to have an impact on the current situation? MFA? Okay, so, you know, uh, I would like to answer this question, also address a couple of comments to give a different perspective on what our panelists are saying. Uh, President Zelensky just issued, for example, um, a couple of hours ago, maybe an hour ago, a very brief video uh, to dispel exactly this kind of notion that, you know, he's somewhere in an undisclosed location and he cannot govern from there. He, uh, the video was shot, it was a selfie video. The video was shot uh, on the streets outside of the presidential administration, downtown Kyiv, where he is every day, you know, um, in the normal circumstances. Uh, and um, there was the head of his party, there was the uh, prime minister, there was the head of his communication, and the chief of staff or chief of the office of the president, they all were there. So the entire government is functional and they're actually in Kyiv and it's not in an undisclosed location, but actually where they usually are. I think Zelensky is trying to make a point that he's not gonna run, Mm -hmm. that uh, it is, you know, and he's supported by the public, by Ukrainians, and this is Ukrainian government And they're not hiding, they're not moving to Lviv or to some other places, unlike some other, uh, you know, you could have expected to push him out. And I think that's the message he has been sending over the last couple of days. And uh, in fact, as a Ukrainian citizen, I'm very proud of that. Now, I also wanted to just real brief mention on sanctions and deterrence effect. There are multiple, you know, I agree with the views. um, that uh, Timothy was putting forward, but in a sense, uh, you know, they are not affected the sanctions in case of Putin. It's not an isolated incident, Ukraine. Even if you take the history of Ukraine from Crimea annexation to the East in 2014, 
You have Georgia in 2008, you have Transnistria in Moldova, you have uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan conflict, recently you have Belarus and you have Kazakhstan. So there is a pattern of you know, certain type of behavior. Now, the, uh, if you look at um, Putin's behavior, he has amassed substantive reserves. Just to put in perspective, his uh, central bank reserves or national wealth reserves, uh, national wealth fund reserves, are of the order of six to eight hundred billion euros. The amount of export he is doing to Europe annually is of the order of two hundred. So if the entire trade is shut down, it's not going to damage because he's going to have, you know, five times of that for a while. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, uh, he has diversified away from dollar yeah. over the last year or so. The central bank reserves are now held in yuan, uh, also somewhat in dollar, but they're really diversified away. Um, so, you know, he has been preparing for this. Uh, and uh, the effectiveness of sanctions has become much less relevant now. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the last point I think I would like to make on all of this is, I don't think that's a change of kind of order uh, of these things. I think, you know, first of all, we all should ask the question, who is the real winner is, and where is the next conflict? Mm -hmm. And the next conflict is, you know, if Ukraine falls, what is the next country? And, you know, my... Uh, forecast, it's the Baltic countries. And who is the real winner here? I think it's China, because Putin is going to get weakened by this situation. And he's going to get isolated from the West to a different degree, perhaps depending on sanctions. And he's going to be more reliant on China. And so China is going to benefit from this, uh, of the weakening of the entire region. So something strategic has to be rethought and made. Uh, you know, the West should rethink its strategy towards deterrence. And it's not just Russia in isolation, and it's not a new development. Mm -hmm. It's a systemic problem which has been there, and China is going to be emboldened by the situation. You've opened the door, uh, Timofey, to a number of areas that I know that our audience is asking about, because I, I had a peek at some of the questions that are coming in, and I'll ask them. I just want, uh, Alexei, to want, have one quick question to you. Um, the Russian foreign minister said today, and I'm quoting him directly here. The Russian operation is being carried out to free Ukrainians from oppression so they can determine their own future. You're sitting in a city that's under attack. You're dodging bombs and missiles. When you hear something like that from uh, Sergei Lubrov, how does that make you feel? I think you're muted. Got to unmute there. No, for some reason, Alexei. Okay, okay. So now you will hear. Putin is crazy. Putin is. Okay, you know. So he doesn't understand Ukraine. He never understood Ukraine. This is arrogance of power. So he miscalculate once again, despite all the polls that we have provided for Ukraine, uh, from Ukraine, that we are ready, that there is a patriotism, and so on and so forth. Let me briefly, because start to respond to some of the points. Uh, actually, I I'm slightly disagree with Timofey. Timofey disappeared because he know I will criticize him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the sanctions definitely are belated. We were asking for these sanctions in 2014, 15, 18, even three months before the start of aggression. If they were done previously, there would be no escalation. My dear West, please take responsibility for that. Uh, however, where I disagree with Timofey, I'm not an economist, it's difficult for me to judge, but from what we hear from the Russian market, the moods of Russian people, uh, they starting, you know, to get nervous. So this is really important. They are not happy about that at all. So the bottom line is the sanctions should be not decreased, but increased, hardened combined with all other possibilities to encourage Ukraine and to isolate Putin. And here we have a lot of spectrum of things, you know, starting from moving all the championships from Russia, mm -hmm. prohibiting Russia to participate in the Eurozone context, contest, and so on and so forth. There was a question on uh, where to send the nations. I shared two links 
which were sent by my colleagues. By the way, one of the link was provided by Kiev School of Economics. So please share it with participants. And uh, there was one question I saw, what are the pragmatic processes that Putin thinks will achieve the replacement of the Zelensky regime? Look, imagine situation when, when Putin occupies Kiev, for example, and he put in force puppet, puppet government, who will trust it? Nobody will trust it in Ukraine. Ukrainians will continue resistance and everybody in Ukraine, especially now, will understand that this is a puppet regime. So basically, it Ukrainians will continue to fight in different forms. Thank you. Oh, all right. Uh, let's uh, let's go to some of the questions that I've uh, been monitoring here. The first one is from uh, Abe Jitalis. Um, now that Putin and Janice, so I'll ask you to answer this one. Now that Putin is moving through the Ukraine, what's to stop him from keeping the momentum and uh, recollecting, recollecting most of the former Soviet countries that they had in the Soviet uh, Union. Um, we heard a partial answer on this earlier, but what's your thought on this? Where, where does if he takes Ukraine, where does he go next? That, that's certainly a, a concern that colleagues in Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania have. It's very real. Uh, first of all, um, as, as our colleagues Timofey and Alexei have said, taking Ukraine is not easy, Peter. And um, the sacrifice that Ukrainians are making are increasing the costs on Putin. And there is a sobering up process when that occurs, when your expectations that something is going to be easy and fast is hard and slow, and in fact involves much larger numbers of casualties. The second big difference, and this is, of course, a tragedy for Ukraine, is that the other countries are members of NATO, and Ukraine is not. And NATO is a collective defense organization. There are already consultations going on at the request of Estonia and others, not Article 5, which says we are under direct threat, but Article 4, they've already invoked, which says we need to prepare we need to think of what the appropriate response will be. And there is surprisingly tough talk coming out of Washington, um, both on the military side and on the political side, that should there be any attack against a NATO member, uh, it would be met with full coercive response. Um, what that would mean and how that would play out is, uh, you know, we don't know, but clearly a very, very strong message is being sent to Putin right now. Uh, Timothy uh, in New York, why don't you try this one? Where did the, this comes from Anthony Popoff. Where did the West go wrong in its dealing with Russia after the Cold War? What should have been done differently in hindsight? Well, you know, it takes two to tango. Um, you know, one can think about, you know, the difficulty of integrating Russia into European uh, security structures. Uh, it was never going to be an easy uh, a task. Um, and at some point in the, in the you know, mid 1990s, uh, the countries of Eastern Europe uh, appealed to the United States to expand NATO something that the US was not initially um, uh, willing to do. This was, you know, it's often pitched as if, you know, that there was a great push from Washington to, to bring these countries on board. And it took a lot of lobbying for the East European countries um, uh, to convince lawmakers in Washington to uh, bring them uh, on board. And I think the thinking was that given the history of bloodshed, two major wars in Europe in the 20th century in this that began in this region, uh, it was better to secure uh, Eastern Europe by bringing them into NATO at the risk of keeping you know, Russia, the largest military in Europe outside of the European uh, security architecture. And that was a, you know, a very difficult um, but conscious choice. And certainly uh, Europe, with a different government um, in Russia in the last 20 years, which has become increasingly, uh, increasingly hostile. Um, so, you know, it's hard, you know, what could have been done differently is, is a, uh, you know, a very difficult 
uh, a question um, uh, uh, to answer, um, but I, I just want to you know remind people that um, you know there's blame to be had on 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 both sides, and one could imagine a very different relationship um, between Russia uh, and NATO with a different government um, in Russia. Moreover, relations can be bad and be short of war. I mean, this is a very different situation um, uh, that we found ourselves in. Countries can be at bad relations for long periods of time, be, you know, disagree about uh, whether or not they have enough respect in the global political order, uh, but that does not mean that uh, a resort to war is uh, in order. Uh, Luke, and uh, this one relates to something that you said earlier. It's from a Samuel Martin. If this conflict is as long and drawn out as Lucan suggests, it could be, is destabilization of the Putin regime a considerable risk? Um, I think that is hard to say. I mean, we should be reminded that right now uh, there is really no, you know, well-organized opposition in Russia. Uh, Putin faces very few challenges. I don't think in the near term, or at least, there's a danger of Putin being ousted. Um, I, I think that the issue is in Ukraine much more, you know, I think it's important that um, the Ukrainian state remain intact. And I think that's sort of the key question right now is not just whether they, they win militarily, but I think, you know, whether the state remains intact. Because uh, I think, you know, if it doesn't, you know, things in Ukraine could become much more violent if there's a real breakdown in, in state in stateness. Uh, I also just want to say quickly something about NATO. I mean, I really think that NATO is a bit of a red herring. Mm -hmm. um, the very fact that Russia has already occupied a portion of Ukrainian territory basically makes it impossible at this stage for Ukraine to join NATO. I mean, that's already been precluded by Russia's actions in, in 2014. And indeed, you know, Putin says he wants to, you know, resist NATO, but he's actually strengthened NATO by, by this action in many ways. I mean, now Finland and Sweden are considering joining. Um, you know, before 2014, you know, there really was very little public support in Ukraine for NATO. Now it's, you know, in the realm of, you know, close to 60%. So, you know, if his intention is to sort of reduce the threat of, of NATO, he's really done the opposite. Can I just ask you, Luke, and uh, because you suggested that, you know, a little opposition in Russia to uh, Putin, and, you know, they, that's true from a parliamentary uh, view, but were you not surprised somewhat in the streets of Moscow and other Russian cities yesterday that there were demonstrators uh, out there who were willing to be arrested? A thousand, I think, somebody said, at least. Uh, does that not show a certain vulnerability? I mean, I said organized opposition. I mean, right. um, that's very important. I'm not saying that, you know, I mean, to a large extent, you know, to an important extent, you know, authoritarianism has been imposed on Russians and I, um, and, I and, um, and Russians, you know, showed enormous bravery in helping to overthrow the Soviet Union in 1991 when I lived in Moscow. Um, but I think for the moment, um, and I, you know, uh, Professor Fry can, can, can um, you know, contribute on this. I mean, you know, Putin is, is very insulated, um, both from public opinion as well as um, from many within his, his, you know, his own entourage. So it's just it's hard to imagine at this point that you know, he's especially vulnerable in in the short term. I, I wouldn't mind a quick reaction from uh, uh, from uh, uh, Timothy Fry in New York on on that point about Putin's vulnerability um, because it. Some people were shocked at, at what they saw last night. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a big country and a lot of people, and that wasn't a lot of people, but it was a significant number uh, who were out on on the streets. Um, and these these questions that have circulated for the last week or so, and we heard it a little bit from Keith earlier uh, about his stability, his mental stability, uh, given some of the things he said and the speeches he's given in the last week. What is your take on that in terms of the Putin we're looking at today? So Putin has, uh, you know, initially was able to rely on economic growth uh, and foreign policy success to build up a huge base of support. But in the last five years, you know, the economy has been stagnant. 
propaganda is not working as well. His, there's a lot of Putin fatigue among uh, the Russian populace. And the notion that you know, Putin could be in power for another 12 years is something that I think most Russians uh, are, aren't greeting with great enthusiasm. And uh, um, uh, you know, also, um, you know, uh, there's, not, there's unlikely to be mass protests in Russia just given the costs. Uh, of, of protesting. Um, but I think what's going on in Russia is a massive reevaluation re of their relationship with the state and with Putin. Uh, there were many influencers, opinion leaders, chattering class um, that for weeks had been telling us Russia is not this kind of state. Putin is just bluffing. Um, uh, Russia will not be invading Ukraine. Uh, and that influential group, which in 2014 was cheering on uh, the annexation of Crimea, has now had to really backtrack and reevaluate um, uh, their positions. Moreover, there's very little evidence that, uh, um, uh, you know, in contrast to 2014, where there was a huge surge in popular support for President Putin, uh, and the demonstrations were in support of the annexation. We're not seeing leading intellectuals speaking out and, and really taking um, you know, staking a claim to backing uh, this invasion. Uh, and the mass public, I think, is also not uh, enthusiastic about this. And the greatest sense, I think, is just disbelief and shock. And through that disbelief and shock is a reevaluation of uh, the Putin government. And I think that that could, you know, how that will be expressed and whether or not you know, this will have meaning politically. You know, I do think it's important. It's much easier to govern as a popular autocrat than an unpopular one. And this move, I don't think is particularly popular. And if the, uh, if, if, um, the cost to Russia increase, it will become increasingly unpopular. Okay, I wanna go back to Kiev in a moment um, for a couple of uh, thoughts from our, our distinguished panelists who were there under terrible circumstances right now. Uh, but uh, there's one question that hasn't been raised yet, and I know it's on a lot of people's minds. And so let me get to it. And it took our, our friend Mel Cap uh, here in Canada to, to ask the question. Uh, and Janice, why don't you try to handle it? Is President Xi watching for the West reaction to gauge what Biden and others would do if he reached for Taiwan? That is a really important question, uh, Mel and Peter. Um, and it depends what we mean by watching. What I do want to dispel is the simple argument that if Putin at huge cost succeeds um, in destabilizing Ukraine, that that would lend, lead President Xi, especially when the United States is distracted and heavily engaged with NATO and even the best national security team only has limited bandwidth, that that would then lead G to say, this is the moment um, for us to strike at Taiwan. I think that is extremely unlikely for two reasons. One, the People's Party's Congress is in November, in which G um, is, his term is going to be renewed. That is a uh, departure from past practice. Uh, this is the first Chinese leader to break out of this 10 year rule. And he is heavily focused on that and will not put that at risk. And secondly, I think there's a big difference between the leadership in China right now and Putin right now. Uh, they are cautious, they are careful. Um, they don't, um, we have no evidence to suggest that they behave in, in the way that Putin has behaved in the last three days. You know, I was interested if I could just answer, take one more minute, Peter. I was really interested in Tim's um, um, evaluation because Putin engaged in a conversation over the last three days about nuclear weapons, uh, which we haven't paid a lot of attention to, but he began by going to the center, to the Russian Missile Command Center and personally participating in supervising a launch, and then made an argument about Ukraine having nuclear capability, which is in fact the opposite of the story because Ukraine voluntarily gave up its nuclear weapons and returned them under US and, and Russian supervision. And I thought to myself, 
where there's a disconnect here. And then finally, there was an explicit nuclear threat um, issue to, to, to Finland and Sweden. Should you join, you will suffer punishment of the likes you've never seen. So there is a rhetoric that Putin is engaging in now that frankly borders on the reckless. That is not what we're seeing in China. And I have to say, it's worrying to hear the leader of Russia talk in the way that he has talked in the last 72 hours. So why does China back him up? I, I think um, backing him up is a little strong. They're very careful. Yes, we have a friendship without limits, but we are committed to the independence and territorial integrity of Ukraine. Um, you know, China, the, the current regime has no love for the United States. There is an uh, escalating tension between the two of them, a round of sanctions that um, had a very, very difficult five years. So I'm sure they delight in the fact um, that the United States is overwhelmingly preoccupied with NATO, but there is a big step from there to taking what would be a very high risk gamble. And it's equally conceivable that a Biden administration that drew a perimeter that excluded Ukraine, were this to happen in Taiwan, would feel itself so challenged, Peter, that it would actually go to war. That's an equally plausible outcome. And I don't think Xi Jinping is that kind of gambler. I want to go back to, uh, to Kiev to, uh, to our colleagues, Timothy and uh, Alexei. Uh, one of the questions that's come in in the last half hour is from here in Canada, and as a result of the um, news conference that the Prime Minister and his, three of his senior ministers had yesterday in terms of Canada's role in, uh, in authorizing a, a degree of sanctions um, in support of Ukraine. Here's the question. How can Western democracies, and it comes from Dorothy Geel, how can Western democracies do more? Christian Freeland, she's the deputy prime minister with Ukrainian connections, uh, said yesterday that Putin's attack is on all democracies, but with only sanctions, how can Ukraine hold a line against Russia? Um, why don't we uh, start with Alexei on that? Okay, Alexei, I'm not sure uh, if you're on Yeah, so you would like me to intervene in the domestic affairs of Canada, <laughs> and Putin tomorrow will say, look, these aggressors from Ukraine, they're trying to undermine Canada from within by involving it in the war with Russia about I regime think, change, regime yeah. change. I, I think uh, you know what yeah, actually, the question is. Actually, there. Peter, I have said something on this issue. I... I think there should be done much more. Uh, an example actually is not from the West, but from Turkey, closure of uh, the Straits. And it could be done. It was done during World War II, but now Turkey refuses to do that. Uh, no fly zone over Ukraine. Well, here the Western democracies are weak. They are not going to risk a war with, with Russia. I think, for example, if before the escalation of the conflict, there would be visits of friendships of NATO, uh, NATO countries to Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kherson, um, I'm not sure if Russia would start a naval attack or land attack into these areas. So definitely the West could have done much more. Uh, well, um, actually, I would like to talk more about what's going in Ukraine. But if you ask about, uh, uh, so let me try to answer some questions because they are connected to NATO, US and what's going on within Ukraine. So first of all, on NATO and the West, look, it's just a pretext for Putin, just a pretext because, uh, because NATO wasn't popular in Ukraine until 2014. Full stop. Only a minority of Ukrainians supported it. Ukrainians wanted to, all the polls showed, Ukrainians wanted to have good relations both with Russia and with the EU. After 2014, it changed completely. 
Now it's going with every round of Russian aggression, it's going up, up, up. And vice versa, support to any form of union with Russia, like economic union is going down. So before this escalation, it was about 10%. 10%. Yeah, we have people with different options, 10%. While more than 50%, 60% are in favor of EU and NATO. So I assume that after this invasion, the support for Ruski Mir, Russian world, would even more decrease. So for those who are interested, I refer you to there's a lot of infographics on polls, very illuminating, uh, on our site, dif.org.ua, Democratic Initiatives Foundation dif.org.ua open an English language because here there, there is an information infographics about that and uh, look here also there was a question on ethnic dimension of the conflict in Ukraine ethnic dimension and here I would like again to remind you that what we have in Ukraine is a political nation political nation it's not based on ethnicity only. So it encompasses Russian speakers, ethnic Russians, Jews and Crimean Tatars. It's testified by all the events since 2014. So you see now, you know, Kyiv is still mostly Russian speaking. And these people are volunteering to defend the country. And finally about uh, about, uh, well, the term was used in one of the questions about breakaway republics. Let me explain. So the last credible poll, credible poll, was in April 2014 in the Donbass. At that time, 70% of the population didn't want to separate from Ukraine, 70%. And definitely they were against Russian troops. So what Russians did, they sent regular troops, occupied one third of Donbass, one third, and proclaimed this People's Republic. Don't believe in the words People's Republic. It's not even Hungarian People's Republic or Polish People's Republic, like it was under Soviet, Soviet communists. It's fully controlled, occupied territories. Full stop, fully controlled, no independent local act. So basically to say self-proclaimed self republics, breakaway republic, this is just Russian bluff, Russian terminology, okay? So that's the answer. These are occupied territories, unfortunately. And that's what we were trying to explain to the West. But the West, you know, called us for dialogue. You'll see what happened finally. Thank you. Timofey, um your thoughts on, on on the question that was asked there, and I know uh, Alexei took it um, and extended it somewhat, but directly on that question of what more can the West do now, like today, what can the West be doing? Okay, so I think one thing is it's, uh, I don't know how to put it diplomatically, uh, but uh, it's a, the West is a bit naive uh, in some ways. and. Uh, even this discussion about what Putin means by saying this or that and NATO, as uh, uh, Lukin pointed out, it's a red herring. You know, he already had, Putin already had what he wanted. No one was offering NATO membership and even EU membership to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine was not, as we have been just discussing, militarized to put up a real resistance. Uh, we don't have, you know, we can shut down, uh, well, we can shut down some, uh, missiles, but, you know, it's clearly that even the capital is being bombarded. So, you know, it doesn't pose really uh, any threat along the lines. It doesn't have any nuclear capacity. So that must be that the audience for his, mass, uh, his messaging is domestic. And I think that's what we're missing here. Now, um, the, our panelists and, you know, we just discussed that there is really no opposition in Russia. This is probably true, no organized opposition. But I served in governments, you know, I was in the cabinet and in multiple positions. There's always an opposition internally. There are multiple oppositions and a leader, especially a dictatorial leader, authoritarian leader, has to balance a number of clans next to him who are a part of, you know, suppressing ecosystem. 
So what the, what is on this on this guy's minds right now? I think um, you know one of our panelists said that people are not very happy with the prospect of 12 years of Putin. But what's going to come after 12 years? At some point, Putin is right now is 69. So we're talking about 10, 15 years anyway, where there would be an attempt at the or a necessity to change power. So the elites around Putin at this point start thinking about the transition of this power because in the dict dictatorial regime, it's not going to be done in two years. You cannot run a campaign in two years. You have to reposition yourself. So in, in five, seven years, you're pretty safe and you have to figure out who's going to be next and that you don't get you know, executed in the process if it's violent. So yeah, they might be you know, very quiet, but this kind of... Um, action, you know, the invasion of Ukraine clearly serves the interest of some of the supporters and weakens the others. So it started a lot of uh, domestic political processes, which will take time to evolve, but they are fundamental. And uh, this probably the fact that he is rushing, so he is so fast and so aggressive and moving so, you know, escalating so much and so quickly, suggests that there is some political dynamics domestically, which we don't understand. Um, thank you for that. We're, we're almost out of time. Uh, and so I, I, I want to try and get our, our, our three panels outside of Ukraine to wrap up their thoughts on this in, in a minute or less. Um, because it has been a fascinating discussion and it, you know, it's brought a lot of things to the forefront. So uh, let me, uh, Lucan, why don't you, you start? And if you can keep your thoughts to, uh, to around a minute, that would be great. Yeah, no, great. So I, mean, I just want to speak in, in terms of the sanctions. I mean, obviously, we've primarily been discussing sanctions, which are unquestionably an important part of the dynamic. But in a sense, we're really beyond sanctions right now. We have a serious situation on the ground and need to focus on making sure that, that you know, the, the Ukrainian military has the support it needs. I mean, uh, I was gratified to hear that Nancy Pelosi has promised $600 million in, in military assistance. I think that is extremely important because, you know, if... if if the Ukrainian military collapses, you know that's the whole. It's a whole other ball game, which is, you know, you know, potentially much greater instability. So I really think we need to think beyond simple uh, economic sanctions. Timothy, New York, uh, got a mute. Putin's you know, greatest uh, claim is that he has brought stability to Russia after the turbulent 1990s. But I think we need to look for signs uh, that that stability might be at risk uh, with this invasion in Ukraine. Um, not necessarily of you know, mass protests, um, but in the sense that his popularity may, may suffer and people will reevaluate their position toward him. And Timothy is right in these types of uh, autocracies. Uh, you know, there's not a regular electoral calendar uh, where people can calculate. Every day is election day in an autocracy because the leader wakes up and thinks today could be the day that I could be uh, removed. And I'm not saying that that's going to happen at any time uh, uh, soon, but to look for the um, uh, fissures and the real conflicts of interest between the hard men in the security services and other elites within Russia who have a very different view for where the country should be headed is something that we should uh, pay attention to. Janice? Uh, just want to agree with my colleagues and uh, particularly Timothy's comment that the West is naive. Um, and maybe we take, that's what we need to take away from this, Peter, that it's important. And the naivete lies in the belief that the norms we hold are accepted by everybody. Um, and that's clearly not the case here. And I see Timothy nodding his head. Mm -hmm. And I think it's most important for us. What can we do? We can clearly look for every way to support Ukraine. But beyond that, to have some very hard hitting discussions with ourselves about some of these naive attitudes we've had, because we are at the beginning of a very, very hard time ahead internationally. Um, Sir, uh, my, my apologies, I'm interrupting just the, uh, to sure. a very specific recommendation of what Ukraine needs in order to withstand the next several days. 
We need fuel, fuel, energy supplies. We need diesel and we need gas. We probably expanded or spent about 10, 15% of our national supply over the last two days because running tanks and helicopters and jets is not easy. Russia is blocking these supplies because some import is coming from Belarus and the other part of import is coming from Odessa and ports are blockaded. So we have to get them from the countries that we are bordering with, which are Poland, Slovakia, Romania, and Hungary. The European Union has supply for three months, so it can share some of this supply and then diversify and procure it from uh, other countries. But, you know, it would be a really tragedy and travesty, one might say, if Ukrainian military were to be able to resist, but wouldn't have diesel uh, to, uh, to put in their tanks. How realistic is it to think a country like Hungary would do that? for you now? Well, businesses can. Um, the country, the governments might not necessarily, uh, but private businesses and international companies, some, and you know, we have money. So the, the, the real issue is not that we cannot buy, that it should, you know, we need, that there's no, we, we need help, that there's security in transportation, because what the real logistical problem is, is that some of the companies will face difficulty getting insurance for transportation. Mm -hmm. So there should be, that's where the governments can step in and uh, insure or maybe pull insure this kind of uh, logistics. Otherwise the market will, um, will, will, you know, will do its job. Last uh, quick thought to you, Alexi, and if you can focus on, the, uh, on this for me. Uh, for so many of us who have been, um, you know, attracted to this story, of your country fighting for its life uh, this week, uh, we you know we live in 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 a, in a degree of safety and calm, especially here in North America, um, and it's awfully hard to identify with what must be going on there. So, can you put this in personal terms for us tonight? You'll be going to to bed in another few hours, trying to sleep through this. What will go through your mind tonight? I need to unmute there. That's a very good question because I'm always trying to explain politics or history through my personal or even uh, ethnic choice, uh, national choice uh, through personal experience. Uh, well, First of all, it was announced that Kyiv is expecting airstrike. So my two daughters who live separately, they went to, they are going to shelters to spend the night in shelters. Not very comfortable, frankly speaking. I will not go to shelter because I know that I will be fully exhausted and I will receive, hopefully, uh, a very early calls from outside of the world to explain the situation. So I try to sleep, to sleep in my apartment, but at the same time, I will, I will prepare tea, coffee and some food and we'll go to volunteers who are outside. So, ah, by the way, and tomorrow morning, if I do not have any other appointments, I will go and try to get my gun. During these two days, I simply didn't have time to do it because uh, they were all around the clock commenting for all the world media and then curfew. So I couldn't go. But tomorrow morning, I believe there would be time for that final. I hope there would be no... Uh, well, it wouldn't be necessary for me to to fight, though I have been at the airport, in Donetsk airport, but uh, for me, ba basically, I have a choice. I have two choices, two dilemmas, which faces Ukraine, whether to evacuate or to stay here. And I decided to stay here. Why? Because I am commanding and I am calling for Ukrainians to join self-defense, so it's not time to be evacuated. And second point, whether to take gun or to continue to spend my day comment, commenting for the world. So I am, as I'm saying, on informational warfare. I am fighting here. I can do it better 
than to have a rifle or gun. But if Russians would arrive to the city, I will do that. I hope it will not happen. Thank you. Well, we all hope that. Um, but I think that's the note on which we're going to, to end this, uh, this fascinating conversation with uh, some remarkable people uh, with their thoughts on, on the situation that continues to unfold at this hour uh, in Ukraine. So I thank you all. And I thank the audience uh, for your questions. I know we, we just uh, touched on some of them, um, but all good questions. And I hope we, we were able to give you some information um, to, uh, to answer some of them. So once again, uh, panelists, thank you for this. Stay safe. Um, and you take care, uh, especially Alexei and uh, Timofey. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this conference. I was happy to be again at Mann School where I was, I had a fellowship. So it's great pleasure to be here as well, again. Uh, so thank you very much. And please open the record to the public and share it with us because I think it was very good discussion. We covered so many different angles and it's worthwhile to share publicly. Thanks a lot. We'll do that.